Hey there, everyone, and welcome to the Fine of Arts, Thursday, March 28th. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a cloudy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we do our best to make sense of these markets, uh, focusing on the charts, focusing primarily on the message that the charts provide back to us in the form of price action. What's great about analyzing the markets using the technical analysis toolkit is it's all based on how investors are voting with their capital. If buyers outnumber sellers or if sellers are outweighing buyers, that is usually reflected pretty clearly in the price action. We have a great guest today, by the way, Buff Dormeyer. Buff has uh, actually done a very good job in recent, uh, in the last many years of uh, contributing to the technical analysis toolkit, particularly in the area of volume. So I'm actually excited to hear uh, from Buff and uh, look at some of the charts that he's paying attention to to try and make sense of these markets as we have the push and pull of a strong trend, weakening momentum. Curious how the volume plays into all of that. With that in mind, let's get to our market recap and look at how the charts evolved here on a Thursday, end of the week here on the shortened holiday week. By the way, we asked you recently on our social media accounts, how many rate cuts will the Fed make in 2024? Now, 21% of you, I don't know if this is uh, bullish or what, but 21% of you saying none. Highly unlikely, folks, because the Fed has made it pretty clear that they're going to uh, cut rates. Of course, anything can happen. That is a theoretically possible scenario. Uh, you know, to, to, for that to happen, you'd have to have a huge spike in some sort of inflation data uh, between now and the next uh, and the next Fed meeting, certainly before the June meeting, which is when the market is pricing in a first cut. So that is possible, but you'd have to see a raging economic growth or some overheated economic conditions that would inspire the Fed to dramatically change this uh, glide path that they've talked about. Most of us are in the one to two cuts. I would actually probably vote three to four. I think we probably have three cuts in 2024. But, you know, again, they, they have mentioned many times, Powell in his last press conference, uh, what was that, last week, uh, you know, reinforced the fact that they're data dependent. And what that means is basically saying leaving the door open to adjust uh, potential policy changes because of how the data comes out. So if you s see signs that inflation is rampantly uh, rising, or if it is dramatically shrinking, maybe you see a change in uh, in that policy. Market pricing in about three rate cuts for 2024. Thanks for uh, responding to that poll, by the way. Make sure you follow us on the social media uh, platforms and you won't miss the next one. Let's keep going here with our market recap. So the S&P and the NASDAQ actually mixed today, which has not happened a lot recently. I feel like they've both been up or both been down in general. Um, to be honest with you, no significant changes from yesterday's close. So the S&P finishing just about 52.54. That's just 0.1% above uh, yesterday's close. And as I composite down about 1.1%, just below 16,380. Mid caps and small caps both having a uh, stronger up day with the S&P 600 small cap index up 0.6% to close just below 1345. The VIX actually pushing just above 13, still in the low teens. So let's not get too excited about a huge upswing in the VIX. Volatility remains low. The VIX remains in that low volatility uh, sort of range in the low teens. VIX around 13 basically means the market is most likely going up, which it generally is on the intermediate and term and, and certainly the long term uh, time frames. The VIX being down at this level basically means there's not a lot of uncertainty, a lot, not a lot of fear as defined by the volatility in the S&P uh, options market. So uh, long and strong is what the VIX is basically telling you at this particular moment. Looking at the uh, interest rate environment, a little mixed as well. The long bond yield came down slightly to 435. The 10-year uh, yield up just slightly to 4.21, uh, we'll call it. The short end of the curve, of course, still elevated. So we still have that inverted yield curve based on the commonly uh, uh, used comparisons that most people uh, look at. Uh, bond prices, no real change significantly from uh, yesterday. And the dollar index up slightly, but sort of a lighter move day, which makes sense, right? Sort of the... Thursday before a long holiday weekend, usually volume is a little bit lighter, usually not a huge sort of movement type of day. A lot of people sort of taking off early and, uh, and things sort of wrap up quietly going into the Easter weekend. And then Monday, we're uh, back to normal after the long uh, three-day weekend for the markets. Gold and silver prices, both in the green. As a matter of fact, all eight of the uh, commodity ETFs that we track on our dashboard are all in the green here. Gold prices up 1.3%. So gold, spot gold continuing to make new all-time highs here. As we wrap uh, Q1, uh, silver prices up slightly as well. Copper prices as well. Crude oil uh, up, up, and uh, energy stocks actually had a pretty decent update, as you'll see in a moment. Bitcoin actually back higher. There's been a little bit choppiness here, I, for, always for Bitcoin, but particularly in the uh, 
last couple of weeks here. We hit 70,000, got above there, I think to around 74,000 before chopping around here. We're pushing back above 70,000, currently around 70,700. That's up uh, just under 2% from yesterday's uh, close, really the end of the 24-hour period. Ether price is up 1.6%. Uh, as well. Most of the top 10 coins finishing in the green today. Energy, utilities, real estate, those are your top three sectors. Now, utilities and real estate were really near or at the top of the list many days this week, and that is not something I have missed. Uh, we've mentioned that. Uh, we always talk about the sector movements, but you know, when, it, when I think about what a market top would look like, obviously, we're not seeing a big sell-off of any sort. Uh, broadly speaking, for our benchmarks, they're still uh, at or near all-time highs, uh, essentially, as we wrap this week. Uh, but I am seeing uh, some non-FANG sectors consistently at the top of the list. We're seeing utilities near the top of the list a number of times this week. The relative strength in utilities still has quite a ways to go before it starts to look constructive, but it's certainly not going down anymore. And utilities, at worst, are hanging in with the markets. And you know, really, in the last month, have uh, slightly outperformed the S&P 500. So when I think about charts to watch going into April, the relative strength of utilities may be one of those ones that I would uh, strongly encourage you to pay attention to because when defensive sectors like utes and real estate start to do well, that implies that institutions are getting more defensive. And that would usually mean uh, they're skeptical of further upside and just want to cushion themselves for further downside. And that usually means that downside is probably imminent. Today, however, energy at the top of the list, the XLE was up 1.1%. Utilities and real estate both up about 0.6 to 0.7%. At the bottom of the list, the only three sectors that are down are your magnificent seven sectors. Consumer discretionary, technology, communication services all finished slightly lower. Consumer discretionary, the XLY, was the worst performer, only down 0.3%, so not too bad. With uh, today's price action wrapping the week, our market trend model now uh, wrapping the week here on a Thursday because of Friday's holiday. Uh, so no trading for bonds and stocks on, uh, on, on Friday. Uh, our market trend model remains bullish on all time frames. I don't think this should be much of a surprise. And again, my market trend model is not intended to surprise. It's more intended to confirm the trends on those different time frames. So when I think about a couple days to a couple weeks, uh, a couple months, and uh, over a year, uh, those trends for the major equity indexes remain firmly bullish at this particular moment. Finally, looking at the uh, what I call the magnificent seven and friends, these eight leading mega cap growth stocks. You can see only two of them finished in the green uh, here on Thursday, Amazon and NVIDIA. Everything else is in the red. Tesla leading the way lower, down two and a quarter percent. Meta down 1.6 percent. Apple down 1.1 percent. Apple's one of those that I keep paying attention to. And the main reason is because it's arguably the weakest of the bunch. Tesla probably wins the prize for the weakest of those eight particular uh, stocks. But Apple literally testing support. So what happens when a market tops, and again, the trend has been positive. So when the trend is so positive, I'm always looking for contrarian evidence, signs that things may not be great, right? Where am I seeing some potential uh, you know, glitches in the, uh, in the matrix here that may be the beginning of something more negative? The divergences that we've highlighted recently, I think certainly fit into that category. Previous leadership names like Apple, which was one of the strongest names in the first half of 2023, becoming really a sideways name uh, since July of last year. And in the last couple months, we've certainly been weaker rather than stronger. We've failed to hold support. We're bouncing up and holding those previous support levels of resistance. Now we're testing a key support level. That's the September and October low. It's a 38.2% retracement level, just below 170, right around 169. And we're right there. So yesterday we bounced off it a bit. Today we're kind of trading back to that level Apple breaks down. I mean, it's just not a great look for that particular stock uh, and could be, uh, in my opinion, the sign of further uh, unwinding of a risk on positioning that has been dominating for quite some time, particularly in the uh, in the growth space. Let's look at a daily chart of the S&P 500. Sorry, I got a little too uh, deep into Apple, but top of mind here is I'm looking at the names that are uh, down today. So yesterday on a, in a dramatic uh, form, I deleted those trend lines that we've been watching for a while because, I, you know, again, trend lines for me are not the be all and end all, they're a visual gauge of the trend in the market. I'm not finding this market tracking trend lines particularly well, so I just got rid of them. I am focusing on this particular price level, which is around 50-50 on the S&P. That's that line in the sand that we've talked about, really a pivot point, because it's been a high and a low uh, tested here a number of times over the last uh, eight weeks or so. Lines up almost perfectly with a 50-day moving average, which is right around at that same point. So in my opinion, you got about a 200-point buffer on the S&P, where we could have a pullback, and I think it would still be 
very easily classified as a bullish phase. And the reason is because we keep making higher highs and higher lows. You want to stop being bullish when we stop that pattern, right? So we start making lower highs and lower lows. That's when it tells you things are different. So we get below that level, then at least we're not making higher lows anymore. And that could be a cause for concern. But for now, as we wrap this uh, holiday week, the momentum is strong but not excessive. The trend is positive. I'm going to assume this market is innocent until proven guilty. We keep making new, uh, new highs, so uh, let's continue to ride that uh, to the upside. New all-time closing high today uh, for the record for the S&P, around 52.54. Uh, On our Mindful Investor Live chart list, one of the charts I, I have is simply called the chart. I just want to spend a moment here because this combines some of the key metrics that I follow and, and I, I created this uh, version of this chart years ago because someone asked me, what, do, what does the chart say about the markets or the S&P? And so I jokingly said, yeah, here's the chart. And I just labeled it like that. And it became a really good kind of cheat sheet for, for major things or important things I was looking at. And I've tweaked the, uh, the inputs on here, but usually four or five different uh, indexes or data series that I think tell the story of what's happening. So from the top, the S&P 500 is clearly trending upwards. This line is sloping up. And so... As long as that continues, I think that's bullish. The advanced decline line in the New York Stock Exchange has also made new highs here in the last month, and I think that's encouraging as well. The percent of stocks above their 50-day overall constructive in that we're over 50%, but all of a sudden getting very near that warning area. When this indicator gets up to around 90%, that usually means we're at a, uh, at a topping point because almost everything is going up. And that usually means, at the very least, a short-term reversal. Now, that worked really well until the last signal, which was in uh, December into January. We sat up around 90% for a little while. We never had a pullback, right? And in 2024, we've had minimal, if no, drawdowns so far for the S&P 500. Now, certain stocks, like a Tesla and an Apple and others, have had a drawdown. But the S&P and the Qs really have not. So it was a bit unusual that you had that signal and, uh, and, and really was a false signal. It didn't really have much of a pullback. So reinitiating that potential sell signal if we would get to 90% here uh, going forward. The bullish percent index on the S&P 500 is above 70%, which tells me to wait for a break below 70%. Same story. We had a signal in late January. It did not play out as expected. The market continued higher. We've reset and we're looking for that to, uh, to signal. Offense over defense, still the story, right? In the last 12 months have been clearly favoring offense, XLY over defense, XLP. I'm actually using the equal weighted versions of those indexes there, uh, but overall uh, pretty constructive. So I would say from a trend following, from a breadth perspective, from a leadership perspective, looking at offense over defense, all of those things at this particular moment are still bullish. So that's not predictive. That's no guarantee that tomorrow or really Monday that that might all change, but uh, that's why you look at this chart to see when those conditions change. At this point, I would say still uh, long and strong, sort of a bullish uh, read on the market conditions. Do want to talk briefly about gold. We mentioned this on yesterday's show. I had a conversation with David Hunter, often brings some uh, extreme uh, predictions about where the uh, markets may go. What I love about conversations with someone like David is it makes you think. And, and conversations that make you think, I think, are uh, usually a good thing. It uh, definitely stretched us in thinking about what is possible and what is probable. But one of the things we talked about is just this everything rally. Stocks, bonds, commodities, all generally speaking in an uptrend. Probably bonds, the least of the three, uh, sort of in a transition period of sorts, bouncing off of support. Uh, but gold moving higher. The GLD made a new high today, closing above uh, 205 for the first time. We can see this powering above the uh, significant resistance that we established from 2024. 2 to 23 to 24. That was uh, resolved to the upside in March. And this thing has just kept going. So we've talked about the opportunities in gold. What's great about gold, generally speaking, is that uh, it's, a, it's usually a very low correlation to stocks over time, right? So generally speaking, stocks and gold, uh, gold has a changing relationship. So diversifying away from stocks and something like gold can often uh, be, a, be a value for, uh, for investors for now. It's just appreciating, right? It's going higher. So higher highs, higher lows. Most recently, the GLD put in a higher low around 198, 199. I would keep an eye on that level if we do get a pullback. But this uh, shortened holiday week finishing in a position of strength for gold. Let's talk about some individual names here to wrap up our market recap. Phillips 66 PSX, one of the biggest gainers in the S&P, up about 2.8% today. And what I love about the chart of PSX is it's just in an uptrend, Right. It is in a clear uptrend uh, of higher highs and higher lows. And a shout out to the folks at 
University of Richmond. I was able to talk to a technical analysis class. So shout out to the, uh, the spiders there in uh, Richmond, Virginia. We were talking about not this particular chart. We were actually, actually talking about DraftKings, DKNG, but Phillips 66 and DraftKings look very similar to me right now. And the fact that they are both in well-established uptrends, higher highs and higher lows. And we talked about that, the value of just starting and keeping it simple. Is this chart in an uptrend or downtrend? Start there and then start to add additional evidence to validate or to corroborate that initial assessment of uh, trends. So PSX, other energy names continue to move higher. Crude oil prices certainly helping that story as uh, crude oil above $80 a barrel, I think is pretty, uh, pretty constructive. Now, DraftKings is an interesting one because yesterday, by the way, you had a bearish candle pattern. This is a bearish engulfing pattern that we noted uh, with, uh, let's see, Tuesday's open to close was higher. It wasn't a big update, but technically a, a higher close. Uh, Wednesday's session, we opened higher, but then closed well below the previous day's open. That's a bearish engulfing pattern today, you know, really sort of remaining around that closing value, but again, close, uh, going lower uh, into the close. You know, so overall, I would say this sort of uh, pattern short term and that tactical time frame is not particularly bullish. But what you want to do is look to the left and recognize that you have the 50 day moving average. You have some of these swing lows from earlier in March, from late in February, which make this daily chart still quite constructive. Right. Because higher highs and higher lows understand the fact that you're going to have pullbacks even within an uptrend. As long as we pull back as we normally would and make higher lows, this chart is still pretty constructive. So I think DraftKings above uh, 40 is still a pretty constructive chart. Same would be the case for Phillips 66 or any of these other names uh, that have had uh, pretty good, uh, pretty good uh, trends. Do want to highlight Capital One Financial COF, obviously in the financial sector, up about 3%. This is on the top 10 list of the S&P 500 names. And again, financials have really uh, started to rally, particularly uh, some of the banks, some of the regional banks, uh, this group uh, in particular is called uh, Consumer Finance, obviously a big credit card component to uh, what Capital One does. But again, recently we've had pullbacks to an ascending 50-day moving average. This most recent rally this week is just continuing that pattern of higher highs and higher lows. We're overbought as of today's close, which doesn't concern me a ton. That usually just means we're going up a lot. I would be concerned if we start to come out of that overbought region, which may tell you we uh, are setting up for a brief pullback. But Again, higher highs and higher lows have been the story. I would assume that that sort of pattern continues until it doesn't. Another breakout name is Freeport MacMoran. We've talked about miners uh, on uh, earlier this week. Uh, Freeport MacMoran, obviously more in the uh, copper space, but in that same general uh, group and certainly in the material sector. What's interesting about the last couple weeks is we've gone to a new, uh, a new swing high. We got about the, above the December high, which on an adjusted basis is around $43 a share. We had this nice rally above that level. And then look at what happened after we broke above resistance, we continue to move higher. And I think that's always important when you have a gap higher, when you have a big breakthrough resistance, it's all about follow through. Do you see additional buyers coming in, pushing price beyond that breakout point or beyond that gap? Freeport MacMoran FCX for now, uh, really short, sort of uh, showing that improving relative strength. I think the weekly chart really showing a breakout uh, out of a uh, congestion area as well. That's it for our market recap. We're going to bring on today's guest, Buff Dormeyer, here in a moment. Before we do so, just one quick reminder, we'd love to hear from you. We appreciate so much your feedback on our show as we evolve Stock Charts TV uh, here going into the second quarter of 2024. Certainly feedback on guests, so we'd love to know who you think we should have on an interview as part of our programming, but we especially want to hear your questions. Our mailbag is running low, and we would love to get your questions. What are you running into as you are trying to analyze these markets using the Technical Analysis Toolkit using stock charts and all the other tools we feature on our show. Email is best, the final bar at stockcharts.com. On X, just tag us in a comment at Final Bar SCTV. And on our YouTube channel here, just drop a comment below the video you're watching. We'd love to hear from you. We'd hope to feature one of your questions in our next mailbag episode. I want to welcome on today's guest, Buff Dormeyer. Buff is the Chief Technical Analyst at Kingsview Investment Management. Usually uh, would be coming to us from Fort Wayne, Indiana today, down at the Student Management Investment Consortium down in Fort Myers, Florida. Buff, welcome to the final bar. I'm so glad we get to uh, share your perspective with our viewers. Welcome to the show. Hey, well, thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. No, it's good to uh, good to see you. I know you've been busy with, uh, you've got a book in the works. You just had ETFs that were launched earlier this month that I want to talk to you about uh, a little bit later. But to start off, just kick us off. And when you're looking at this market as we wrap Q1, it's obviously been a pretty strong experience for risk assets, sort of the everything rally. When you're looking around you, what do you see? What stands out to you? 
So first of all, you have to know what kind of investor you are. Are you are you a short term trader or are you a a, a a position person? And I'm I'm a position person, and um, I used to be in the game where I would try to call a top. I think I used to be pretty good at it. Not 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 perfect by any means, but um, so right now as a position trader, what I'm looking for is specifically is money flowing in the market. And if money's flowing in, if the if the market be dr is driven higher, we want to see increased uh, capital flows following uh, that that uptrend. And we are so the market is moving higher. We like the trend, and it, it is fueled by those capital flows. And those capital flows continue to move in into the to the broad markets, which which for me says that we want to stay long. Are there some things that short term that that bring me pause? Yes, sentiment is is way too bullish right now. Um, there's some things happening with uh, uh, with the say the cues that are that say, suggest that maybe they're a little getting a uh, they they need a little breather here. But overall, markets the money's I want to follow the money, and the money's still moving into the into the market. We're starting with a weekly chart of the QQQ. I just brought it up here. And just so we're clear, so everyone can follow along, we have a weekly chart. We have the volume by price indicator sort of showing you volume at different uh, price tiers. Then we have an RSI and the money flow index at the bottom. The Qs, as you mentioned in our uh, email exchange earlier today, sort of represents the generals, right, the leadership. Are you encouraged by the action you're seeing from this part of the market? Very much. Uh, the, the, the generals have been leading uh, this market from the uh, 22 bottom. So they they have been the the, the place to be. This is definitely the, the strongest. Uh, we've we've had a multi all time high breakout here. All that is is ex exceptionally uh, positive. We look at the volume uh, at price. You know there really is no more resistance uh, because we're we're approaching all time highs and we've broken through some very significant levels. So mm. all that on the on the intermediate long term is still very positive. You mentioned, uh, and we're looking at the uh, switch into the daily chart of it. You know, what does it mean to you with the money flow index in particular at the bottom has been sloping downwards here, maybe over the last six to eight weeks. What is that sort of divergence? Does that is that a warning sign or how would you interpret that sort of uh, disagreement here at the moment? Right. That that's what's one of the things that we mentioned that's giving me pause on the short term. So on the top there, you have RSI. And notice the RSI is, you know, it's not showing bullish, but and it's weakening. But look at the MFI. The MFI is the same thing as the RSI, except it's weighted by volume. And you can see that it's, it's strongly, as opposed to going sideways, it's going down. And so what is that telling us is it's telling this volume is not supporting the short term uh, price movement. So this gives me pause. It doesn't say that it's it's a sell, but I probably wouldn't be accumulating more here. Mm. The uh, you know so the generals uh, have been have been doing quite well. Small caps, sort of the troops, have not been as particularly strong. We've had this sort of large over small theme that I think we've been you know covering widely here off of the October low. Are you encouraged by what you're seeing more recently with small caps, or would you be looking there as an opportunity, or still sort of underweight that space? Well, you have to be you have to be at this point uh, underweighted. Short term, I am encouraged. Even today's action, you know. So we've been caught. Uh, you know, the both the uh, the S and P and the uh, and and the uh, the Russell two thousand both had dojis just just you know, which suggests a short term pause in the, in the movement mm. um, on a weekly basis. Just a few weeks ago, and. The S and P and the Qs were able to make uh, go on to new highs, um, but other than today's action, where we just slightly went over the the the, the top end of the of that doji, uh, it, the the uh, IWM or the Russell two thousand has been stuck inside that long range of that of that doji. Mm. Um, if we're able to make it through here uh, above two ten. If you look at that volume on price, there isn't a whole lot of resistance until you get to like 220, 225. So we we do have a, a window here where we could see maybe the generals um, take more of a breather and possibly the, the troops make up that ground.
Interesting. And uh, let's look at a couple individual names, if we could. You had a couple that you shared with me uh, ahead of time. FIS was one of those. Uh, Fidelity National Information Services were, I had the daily chart up here, but uh, talk me through this particular name and uh, and what you like or you don't like here. Okay, so this is uh, this is the one one of that one of those that uh, I um, I like here, and one of the reasons is is that it, it's 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 broken out of a of a of a base, and there isn't a whole lot of resistance with that volume uh, volume on price. It, it's just mm. as you keep on moving up up the chart, the, there's less and less resistance there to uh, to uh, on the volume. Uh, volume at price, and then um, is this is this David da daily or the weekly? Oh, this is the daily. I'm happy to bring it, up either, Bob. Yeah, let, let's look at the weekly. Sure. Uh, this, is, this is this is the setup that I, I'm looking at. So if you can see that the the money flow index is leading the the RSI, hmm. and so what I that's one of the key uh, variables that I I like to look at is I want to see that that MFI leading the RSI and you're certainly seeing it here on on a weekly basis. Um you can see that it, it that it, it started off better. Um it held up much stronger during the during the uh during the sell off and now that it's going up is leading leading higher the MFI over the RSI. This is really interesting. I'm so glad you're on here above because this is a really interesting relationship looking at the money flow index versus the relative strength index thinking about what that relationship might uh, might imply. Um, I really appreciate it. With a name like this, I mean, with a name like FAS, just as an example, how do you manage sort of the risk versus reward? And I guess another way to put it is if you do think it's a constructive setup here, what would you need to see to maybe uh, change that uh, outlook or, or uh, you know, trigger some sort of uh, risk management uh, idea in your mind? What would tell you that uh, this is uh, no longer a good idea? Anything in particular that you look for? Well, you can see that big... Uh... That that big candle there, where it where it shot up, mm -hmm. um, the top of that range I would look at as a as a support level. So if it were to break through uh, that that range, uh, I at that point I would have to 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 reset it. So and that's really what, what when it comes when it comes to my own uh, investing and in my my approach. Uh, volume's important on the uh, very important. Uh, on the the setup, um, watching the trend develop, but at some point you you have to when you have to draw a line is it's often price that that is uh, is the determination mm, because you a lot have of, to have yeah. something solid that to uh, that you can use as you know as that as that point of when you're managing risk. Yeah, you've done a, such a great job in your work, Buff, and in the books you've written before about. Thinking about that price volume relationship, I, I think you've innovated more than many on on that particular topic. So thank, thanks for what you've added to the technical toolkit uh, so far. Another name we wanted to look at was uh, FSTR, which is a which is a name LB Foster. This is a building materials name. We're looking at the weekly chart here. Yeah, so so you can see here that uh, this stock had built a a nice kind of rounding base, and then broke out. And now you can see that on the intermediate term, it is a, it has again uh, starting to break out on the intermediate term side. So if you get a if you're more of a, a looking at the daily charts, you had the breakout, but now in the immediate terms, it's starting to show it's starting to show strength too. Mm. Um, the daily chart as well, and I was going to say it's interesting how when you're looking at both the weekly and the daily charts, can you just comment about how you consider these multiple time frames uh, together? What's your process of evaluating these names on, I guess, different time frames, long term versus short term? So I, being more of a position trader, I'm I'm going to look at the weeklies. That's yeah. that's where um, that's where I'm going to get my ideas from. Right. But then but then when I once I have the idea, then I'm going to flip flip over to the daily. And I'm gonna look. What is it now? A good time to enter that position, or maybe, uh, or or not. In in this case, uh, I got a I got a, a comp, I got a a good uh, good indications on the on the intermediate term chart. Um, you know, maybe a week or so ago, and then at the same time here is breaking out of, of this on on the daily. So yeah, that tells me okay, 
it looks good on the intermediate term and now in the short term it's it, it it's it's getting ready to break out now it has uh, well said, and I love that. I uh, love that thinking about multiple time frames, how to relate them. But we're almost done. But I do want to mention. I know you had new ETFs that were just released earlier this month: the Monarch Volume Factor Dividend, Mon Monarch Volume Factor Growth. What can you tell us about these ETFs? What's the general methodology, and uh, and what are you looking to accomplish with these? So these are all around what what I consider the volume factor. Uh, we all know volume is a, a is as a as a important data set we all know it as a leading indicator but what most people don't realize hardly anyone realizes is that volume is more than that it's actually an an investment factor and so what we do with with the volume factor is we look at how one how do we employ it uh for our uh, offense which is our security ranking system and understanding which securities that 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 we want to own and of course, in volume analysis, we want to own those that are garnering the highest, the strongest uh, capital flows. Two, we we employ a defense. Okay, so we have a a, a good offense, a prolific offense, but we want to combine that with a championship defense and understanding uh, the broad market. And is the broad market still garnering capital flows? Um, or is it like in 2022, it has it broken down? And we want to be in the market uh, when capital flows are positive versus um, when they're negative. That's when, you know, a lot of people say, hey, just hang on and write it out. You know, people that are that are in the distribution phase, they can't take, uh, they, they often can't take those those large declines. So managing the risk is, is, is extremely important. And so if the market isn't healthy, it's time to, to step aside and, and uh, take risk off. And the last thing we do, which hardly anyone does, is once you're on defense, how do you transition back to offense? Mm. And, and, what, and the tool that we use there is we try to, is we use these like ETFs, like particularly the, the spider, and we want to see what, what are the uh, and what are the owners of the spider doing? Because generally, these people um, are really good sentiment gaugers, and so we can. They're usually doing the wrong thing at precisely uh, the wrong time. And so, if we do the opposite of them, it, they often gives us very good setups as to when, when you're in a, a strong market decline, when have these people capitulated? That's when we want to re-enter. Well so said, offense, Bob. defense, and special teams. Hey, listen, congrats on the new ETFs. Wish you the very, very best. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and thanks so much again for all you've done to promote the use of volume and I think expand the technical toolkit. So great to see you, Bob. Thanks for coming on the show. I hope we can do this again. All right. Thank, thank you, Dave. And thanks for all you do. That's Buff Dormeyer. Buff's the chief technical analyst at Kingsview Investment Management uh, based in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Those two ETFs that we mentioned, the tickers are MVFD and MVFG. Buff's written a book on uh, volume indicators he's designed. He has another book in the works, and we uh, wish him very well with the ETFs and certainly with uh, the new book coming out. I hope you listen to some of the things Buff said in 10 minutes. We covered a lot of really good little nuggets of investment wisdom, thinking about different time frames. And, and for him, thinking, I'm more of a position trader, so I'm starting with the weekly chart. I'm always uh, surprised when investors have a misalignment between what questions they're trying to answer, how they're trying to uh, play the game, and then the types of charts they're looking at, the time frame. So good uh, words of wisdom there from Buff Dormeyer of uh, Kingsview uh, Investment Management. Folks, we've got to wrap the show and go to the three in three, three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here's chart number one. I titled this chart Sentiment Extremes. I want to highlight this is a sort of an adaptation of a series of charts that I have on my Mindful Investor Live chart list. This is a weekly chart of the S&P 500 in the top panel. Below that, we have the AAII survey, the bulls in green, the bears in red. In the bottom, we have the name exposure index. So just to remind you, if you're not familiar with these sentiment indicators, this is the AAII survey in green and red. This is a weekly survey of individual investors that are part of that organization. They are asked, are you bullish, bearish, or neutral on stocks, I believe, for the next six months. And uh, it comes out, uh, it really runs through Wednesday. I think it's reported midday on Thursday. So this most recent uh, weekly data came in at bulls right at 50%. 50% is where I have that uh, horizontal line a lot of times on these charts because 
Uh, above 50% is sort of that threshold of extreme uh, optimism, right? When you have over 50%, over half of the respondents being bullish, that is uh, fairly rare. It's, uh, it's, it's not too often that you get above that 50% level. And it often indicates a, an extreme sort of euphoric positioning where sort of everyone's bullish at that particular moment. Now, not everyone, right? Because 22% of the respondents were bearish and the remainder, of course, are in that neutral bucket. But over a two to one ratio of bears over bulls. And if you look to the left, it's not a perfect signal. It's not like we always top out when that gets an extreme, but it does tell me to start to look for signs of, uh, of exhaustion, of trend exhaustion, indicating that a lack of buyers is, uh, is unable to, uh, or basically prevents a uh, further upside in, uh, in stock. So the AAII survey getting to a pretty, a pretty bold up number right at 50% bulls. The name exposure index is a weekly survey of money managers where they're asked, what's your exposure to stocks? And this week we got above 100%. And that happened a couple weeks ago. But before then, you have to go back to uh, December of last year, July of last year, and then uh, going back to the end of 2021. And that sort of over 100% level is, uh, again, sort of a euphoric level for me. When we get leveraged long as the answer in that survey, that tells me, again, not guaranteed we're gonna have a market top, but it tells me to start looking for the conditions that are common because that is a common component at major tops is you have extreme bullishness, extreme optimism. I would say these sentiment indicators are kind of there. Chart number two, and I forgive me whoever pointed this out to me years ago. I, I have to look through the deep history of the final bar. We've got four years plus over a thousand episodes to go through. I don't, I don't know how quickly I'm gonna come up with this, but I remember one guest at some point talked about hotels versus utilities, thinking of hotels as sort of a great travel tourism play, tend to do good when the market conditions are strong, when the economy is growing. Utilities is more of a pure defensive play. You don't own utilities unless you don't want to own other things and you're just trying to get defensive and write out periods of market uncertainty. The top panel is showing you the ratio of the Dow Hotels Index and the Dow Utilities Index. You will find that the movements of that index match very well with the relative movements of the S&P 500, which is in blue on the bottom half here. And particularly from you know, 2021 on, look how closely the movements in uh, hotels versus utilities match here. And very noticeably really improved at the, uh, in the second half of 2022. While the S&P was still making a new low, this ratio is actually popping higher in October of 22. So looking to see if we get a change in that ratio is meaningful. And I can't help but notice there's currently a disagreement from the last six uh, weeks or so with the S&P continuing to make higher highs, but this ratio actually turning lower. I might keep an eye on this one to see if we get a further retracement lower in the hotels versus utilities index. Finally, Amazon.com, a name I'm sure you're familiar with. What I want to highlight here, we were doing a, a, a quick video earlier this week on the Gravestone Doji, and I noticed on this particular chart, that is what uh, for now has signified the top. First week in March, you get that gravestone doji where the open and close are near the lows of the day. You have a big upper shadow and no lower shadow. Just yesterday, we had what's called a dragonfly doji where the open and close are near the highs of the day. Little to no upper shadow and a long lower shadow. Both of those represent indecision. Both of those suggest that a market trend has stalled out. And so those sorts of uh, candle patterns at a high, and look at how many times the uh, intraday movement has gone above there, but we've closed back below. Just today, we finished slightly above there, but it wasn't a big update. I'd be keeping an eye on this 180 level next week and see if Amazon is able to get a foothold above that support. If not, this key stock may continue to be range bound. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. I want to thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. We'll have a mailbag episode for you tomorrow on Good Friday, and we'll be back to normal on Monday. Special thanks to Buff Dormeyer joining us remotely from Fort Myers, Florida. For Stock Charts and Rev in Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe, have a good night.